Go ahead and keep your uh, Bibles at 1 John. Uh, we're going to be digging into that passage in a second. Uh, as you do that, some months back, uh, I was able to, to take some time away. Now, normally when I do that, it's always been, you know, with the family for a family vacation. Uh, but for the first time in my married life, I uh, was able to, to kind of get away by myself. Uh, and that was a mixed blessing. I mean, part of that was sort of mourning that my family wasn't with me. Part of that was kind of a nice experience of that solitude and that silence. Uh, but I did something a little bit unique, and I, I went on a motorcycle trip, and I tried to kind of hit as many states as I was able to make. Uh, I think I went, rode through like some 18, 19 different states. My, my favorite part of which, by far, was this section in Virginia. Uh, it's the, uh, the Skyline Ridgeway. Uh, it's a national park, Shenandoah National Forest, uh, and it follows on the Appalachian Mountains, uh, it follows that peak or that ridge that kind of runs from north to south. Uh, it dumps into the Blue Ridge Parkway. It's about 400, 450 miles of uninterrupted, you don't go through a single town, there's not a stoplight, there's not a stop sign, just one straight road that winds through the ridge of this Appalachian Mountain, uh, and it's simply gorgeous. Uh, and so I'm driving through that, riding through that, and just spending this time in prayer and delight. And they had these, these scenic overlooks, uh, and particularly in the Shenandoah, you were able to pull off probably every mile or two. Uh, and sometimes it's on the east side of the Appalachian, sometimes it's on the west side, uh, and you get those varied views. Uh, sometimes early in the morning, was able to catch the sunrise, was able to catch the sunsets and everything in between that was there. Absolutely gorgeous and beautiful. And that ability, that ability to be able to kind of step back and look down and just see, see for miles and miles and miles and miles, see these huge towns uh, down in the valleys that look like little dots and specks because you're so far up into the mountains, right? Uh, just be able to get that bird's eye view of what's happening. Now, true, Every once in a while, you'd have this wonderful scenic overlook, and there'd be a big McDonald's sign way off in the valley that kind of threw everything off a little bit. But it was gorgeous. It's absolutely gorgeous. By far, probably my, my favorite time in the entire trip. And the reason I bring that up now is for this. You know, what, what John's doing in the, in the passages that Marty just read and that we're going to be going into, John is, is in a sense, stepping back. He, he's referring to some themes that he's already brought up. Okay, 1 John is a very repetitive letter, and he's being repetitive for a reason. He, he's trying to drive some truths home for us. There's not a lot of content in 1 John. There's not a lot of varied discussion. It's not Romans. I mean, Romans is like, kind of like this meat grinder. You read it sentence by sentence, word by word, because Paul packs so much theology into the book of Romans. I mean, try preaching a sermon, or if you're a Sunday school teacher, try teaching a lesson on Romans that covers like three chapters. You know how many doctrines you got in those three chapters? It's just immense. First John doesn't work like that. First John is very simple. First John is very relational. First John is very repetitive. It comes back to the same themes again and again and again. And the reason it does that is because John wants, when we're done reading this letter, when we're done studying this letter as a congregation, if we were the original audience, when we're done reading it for the first time, he wants us to walk away and get just a couple of three things that we really grab a hold of and really take home and take rootedness in our heart. And as this letter is coming to the close, because we're just now entering the final chapter, as this letter is coming to a close, John kind of steps back and he pulls back the curtain and he shows us an overlook a way of looking at our salvation, not from our perspective, but rather from God's perspective. Because we get stuck in the trenches. That's where you and I live, right? We can't get out of it, even if we wanted to. We do not have a bird's eye view. Uh, there is no mountain that you and I can climb and look down and see ourselves where we're at, right? We rely on God's perspective and what God tells us about his perspective. But we live in the trenches. We live with the betrayal of friendships. We live with the pain of death. We live with the misery of divorce. We would live with the difficulty of rebellious children. We live with the uncomfortable reality of a loss of job or a job that doesn't quite pay the bills that we need. We live with those realities, financial or social or emotional or relational. Those are the trends in which we find ourselves all the time. And because of that, and that doesn't even count. 
I'm not even gotten into our own battle with sin, right? As believers, our own battle with sin. Knowing that we're saved, striving to live lives of obedience, but, but yet when we stop and look inward, we feel often shame, right? You guys have probably heard this uh, metaphor before, expression before, but I mean, who of us would want our thoughts broadcast on the screen behind me for everybody to see, right? I mean, you wouldn't even let me be your pastor if you saw where my head was going half the time. Uh, I wouldn't even want you to be a congregant if I saw where your head was going. That's just the reality of where we're at. We are individuals who, if we have accepted Christ as our Savior, still battle with things. And it's difficult. And that perspective, right, that perspective is hard to kind of get out of. And there's another side to that as well. There are those individuals and even those believers who, who battle with sin, but they don't admit they battle with sin. They maybe add some external rules that they're able to follow and keep, and they, they think that that's the same thing as holiness, and they begin to have a puffed up, overconfident, exaggerated, non-realistic view of themselves, right? And so they don't view themselves as lowly as they actually are. They think they have this broader, higher perspective when the reality is, is they're simply trapped in pride. They're in the trenches. You might be trapped in pride this morning. You might be trapped in shame this morning. You might be trapped in difficulty this morning. You might be trapped in tension this morning. But I know this, we feel trapped, right? We feel those trenches. And so when we come to passages like this, we need to cherish them, okay? Because it gives us a view of our salvation that we couldn't otherwise see. And it's God looking down on the mountaintop, looking down at this scenic overlook, and seeing the fruit of our salvation that maybe the view of that is being blocked from us because where we happen to find ourselves and the difficulties we happen to oversee. It's, it's like when a marriage... When a marriage is experiencing difficulty and tension, right? So you've been, you've been at marriage for several years. Uh, and by the way, the, the four, five, six year mark is a tough period for a lot of marriages, okay? Because you've been together long enough that you feel like you've got to stick with it. Uh, but you've been there long enough that you really know the other person and you really don't want to stick with it anymore. I mean, you kind of, you're in that tension and you're in that time period. You look at this person who was a delight just a couple of years ago, and then now they're just a source of frustration and misery. But I mean, you already got so much time into it, you might as well finish it off. And so you feel that's kind of where you're at, right? Uh, and, And so marriage can become this tense thing and you tend to forget the joy. You tend to forget the love. You tend to forget the covenant. You tend to forget the strengths and the abilities and the giftedness and the uniqueness of your partner because all you feel, all you see is the tension and the irritations and the difficulties, right? Our salvation can kind of work the same way. We just tend to see those tensions, those battles with sin that we lose sight of this phenomenal thing that Jesus has done. So with that in mind, uh, turn back, or if you're still there, 1 John chapter 5. I'm going to read the entire thing again, and then I'm going to call out two verses. It says this, everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God, and everyone who loves the Father loves his child as well. This is how we know that we love the children of God by loving God and carrying out his commands. This is love for God, to obey his commands. And his commands are not burdensome, for everyone born of God overcomes the world. This is the victory that overcomes the world, even our faith. Who is it that overcomes the world? Only he who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. So several things there, but let's break that down. Look at verse 1 again. Everyone who believes that Jesus is is Christ is born of God. Now skip down uh, to verse 5. Who is it that overcomes the world? Only he who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. So the way this works is a little bit like this. There's like a bookend that's taking place. And so in verse 1, you have this subject that's brought up, and that's belief in Jesus Christ. 
verse 5, which is sort of like the unit that we're dealing with, that also deals with belief in Jesus Christ. So it begins and it ends with this discussion of belief in Jesus Christ. So it serves as like bookends and everything in between is supposed to be read in that grid, right? So again, they didn't have bold and underline and italics. Uh, They didn't have that stuff to work with. I mean, they didn't even get the type print until the 1500s, and we didn't even have that at that time either. So they had to use a system in which, how do you call out something as being important? How do you flag something? So if you go back and you read like Genesis or Deuteronomy or 1st and 2nd Kings and Chronicles and that whole stuff, have you guys ever read that and noticed entire huge chunks are just being repeated? Sometimes word for word. I mean, you read this huge long account, maybe like a chronology, And like three verses later, they do the exact same thing again, the entire thing repeated and over again. You're like, what in the world? I mean, it was just like sheepskin for free back then. You guys just didn't care. Well, they do that because it's it's their way of emphasizing something. The Old Testament repeats over and over and over again the material that it's trying to draw your attention to. Okay. Another system, another device that they would use both in the Old Testament and the New Testament is something they called a chiasm. Fancy word. All you need to know is this. They kind of bookend something in order to point towards something in the middle or in order to set the stage for something. In other words, everything we're going to talk about regarding love for one another, which is talked about in these verses, everything that John's going to talk about regarding obedience to God, which is talked about in those five verses, must be understood within the context of faith. They have to be understood within the bookends of belief. And if we miss that, we miss the idea of obedience. And that just drives us into legalism. Or it drives us into this license and liberty to do whatever we want. If we misunderstand the context of belief and we're just dealing with the issue of loving people, then what we have is what our world offers us, that it has this worldly view of love where you don't speak truth into someone's life. You don't warn someone of difficulty and danger. You you don't try to lovingly, but yet gently, yet truthfully and clearly call out a path of dysfunction and sin and harm that they're doing to themselves. Instead, we have this modern view of love, which is unless you accept everything about me and everything that I believe in and everything that I claim to be and are in 100% agreement with all of my ideas and philosophies and worldviews, then you can't possibly love me. But yet we see this biblical context of love, which is set within the bookends of belief, set within the bookends of faith. So if we don't approach loving other people within those bookends or obedience to God within those bookends, then whatever expression we end up with is going to be distorted and wrong and frankly not the gospel, right? So when John's calling our attention to belief, okay, we're using this metaphor of the scenic overlook. So you're you're driving on this mountain road on your motorcycle and you're winding through this path and there's this overlook sign. So you pull off and you look at this view. The first view, uh, God's eye view, this bird's eye view of our salvation is a theological view or a biblical view, right? Or a doctrinal view of our salvation. So what's, what's happening? When we accept Christ as our Savior, what's occurring there at that moment in time? Why this emphasis, verse 1, and again, verse 5, on belief? And why is that emphasis so very important to John? Okay, and I think here's here's the reason why. In fact, if you turn your Bibles to Romans chapter 10, we're going to turn to Romans 10, and then we're going to turn to Psalm 49, okay? So Romans chapter 10. Now, this is Paul, completely different guy. Paul says this in Romans 10, verse 9, okay? So this is one of, one of the best Bible verses that I can think of to kind of capture concretely and simplistically and clearly and in a very short way why belief is so absolutely important and what it does, okay? It says this in verse 9, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved, right? 
This is why John and Paul and Peter and Jesus, and we can even go into the Old Testament, and we will in a second in Psalm 49, this is why they emphasize belief so very much, because this is that thing that puts us in a right relationship with God. And this is not just a New Testament concept, guys. This is a Bible concept. We see this in the Old Testament, looking forward to what's going to be happening in Jesus. And of course, we see it all over the New Testament. But look in Psalm 49, a great psalm, okay? A psalm, by the way, that's often kind of overlooked when people study the psalms, uh, to to our own um, shame, probably. This is a a longer section of scripture I'm going to read, but I want you to kind of catch the flow of what's happening. So Psalm 49, okay? It's to the director of music, the sons of Korah. It says this, Hear this, all you peoples. Listen, all who live in the world, both low and high, rich and poor alike. My mouth will speak words of wisdom. The utterance from my heart will give understanding. I will turn my ear to a proverb with the harp, I will expound my riddle. Now stay with me. Okay, so this is the context there. They're, they're singing this. And, and I wish, I wish we had the musical notation or the musical markings so we knew what these songs sounded like when they were actually sung. That has not survived. That's not been passed down. And I think the, probably the reason for that is because God doesn't like it when we fight about worship music styles. I think that's probably what it is. So, and so he just gives us, he gives us truth, right? Uh, And so he gives us words. He gives us content. That's what he wants passed down. But here's the context that's going on. It's this song that's praising God, that's worshiping, that's joyous about a truth. And we have not even gotten to the truth yet, what that truth is. But whatever this truth is that we're about to read, the psalmist is really excited about it, so excited about it, They composed, or he composed, a song and sung it publicly, and the people of Israel responded by continuing to sing the song when they gathered together, okay? They were that excited about it. I mean, it made the top 150. They were really excited about this song. And so this is, this is the, you follow this, this is the content of this song that they were so excited about. It says this, verse 5, why should I fear when evil days come, when wicked deceivers surround me? Those who trust in their wealth and boast in their great riches, no man can redeem the life of another or give to God a ransom for him. The ransom for a life is costly. No payment is ever enough that he should live on forever and not see decay. For all can see that wise men die. The foolish and the senseless alike perish and leave their wealth to others. Their tombs remain, their ho- will remain their houses forever, their dwellings for endless generations, though they have named lands after themselves. But man, despite his riches, does not endure. He, like the beasts, perish. This is the fate of those who trust in themselves and of their followers who approve their sayings. Like sheep, they are destined for their grave, the death and death will feed on them. The upright will rule over them in the morning. Their forms will decay in the grave, far from their princely mansions. That is not something you sing at a party, right? Okay? I mean, think about, I mean, have you ever encountered, I mean, uh, a contemporary worship song that, that sounds like this? I've never encountered a hymn, an old hymn that sounds like this, right? I mean, this is kind of dark, maybe a little bit on the morbid side. It's kind of like singing a song, hey, we're all gonna die, it really stinks, we're gonna go to the grave, that's it forever, boy, this is a bummer. I mean, set that to a tune, right? That's kind of what's happening here. So why is the psalmist so excited about this? I mean, it's a psalm of praise. It's a psalm where they're calling out the worth of God. So why would they start this way? Because of verse 15, okay? Verse 15 says this, but God will redeem my life from the grave and surely take me to himself. This is what Paul is talking about in Romans chapter 10, verse 9. This is what John is talking about in 1 John 5, verse 1, and 1 John 5, verse 5, when he talks about belief, believing that Jesus is who he says he is. 
And this is why the psalmist wrote this song, which began with 14 verses that were somewhat morbid. And verse 7, by the way, sing, singularly calls out or puts focus on the fact that we are trapped, we're going to die, death is going to consume us, death is going to eat us, right? There's no escaping this. And verse 7 says, and we cannot redeem ourselves. We cannot fix this. Nobody can fix this for you. There's no one who can die for you to pay what you owe. There's no other human being who can make this right on your behalf. And this is the horror for parents. Oh, that we could die to make things right for our children. Oh, that we could give a sacrifice or pay a tithe or serve on a committee or serve in a ministry program to make our children have a right relationship with the king. But no man can redeem you. That's why it takes God. And that's why Jesus had to come, right? Jesus came to pay this price. And this is what the psalmist was looking forward to. And the best part is he didn't even have all the details. He didn't know what that would look like. He didn't know who that would be. He just knew there was a promise of salvation that come that my God is going to fix this problem. And was so excited, so happy, he wrote a praise song about it, right? You and I live on this side of the cross of Jesus Christ. This psalmist looked forward to something that was vague and unclear and unknown, yet he knew it was true and it delighted his soul. You and I look back on something that is clear and known and specific. May it so delight our soul even more to have a belief in Jesus Christ, right? Which forgives all, adopts us, transforms us, not based on our works. In fact, our works simply get in the way. The best that you have to offer is something that God tells us in the Old Testament he views as filthy, bloody rags. It's nothing to him. He doesn't even want them in his presence. It adds nothing to the equation whatsoever. It's always been about coming before Jesus. And, and brothers and sisters, and I say this to those who have accepted Jesus as their Lord and Savior, when you called out to Christ in faith, do you see, do you see from God's perspective what's occurred? Because that's what the scenic overlook idea is all about, is we, we step back and God's opened this curtain to his perspective, and he's reminding us, when you put your faith and your trust in Jesus he fixed this. This problem, this chasm, this difficulty, this damnation, this judgment, this being trapped, this being dead to sin, all of these different metaphors that the Bible gives, Jesus came and fixed this. It's been done. You're okay. You're with him. You're his child. That's the idea. That's the curtain that's drawn back because we get trapped in the trenches and we see our battles with sin and yes, especially those battles with sin that we seem to continue to lose. And as John is closing out this letter, he's reminding everyday, normal, struggling Christians that their belief in Jesus Christ has already accomplished the victory, right? There's no more work to be done. There's nothing to earn from this point forward. Now, we get the joy of being completely different people, new outlooks, right? New desires, uh, new goals, new objectives, right? New loves and new passions, which work itself out in holiness. We're going to get to the obedience factor in a second. But it all begins with this issue of belief, because if we don't put this first, then any pursuit of belief that we go after, or any pursuit of obedience that we go after, simply becomes cruel and ugly and oppressive. But we have to start with this issue of belief. I am saved. I have been forgiven. I put my faith in Jesus. He alone has saved me. But the good news is now he brings me along for the ride, right? Now he brings me along for the ride, and what a ride it is. Okay, so then it continues. So back to 1 John chapter 5. 1 John chapter 5 and then verse 2. 
Well, let's kind of continue with, with uh, we'll just start over. Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God, and everyone uh, who loves the Father loves his child as well. This is how we know that we love the children of God, by loving God and carrying out his commands. This is love for God to obey his commands. So verse two kind of brings up a new scenic overlook. Verse one is the overlook of faith and belief. It's revisited in verse five. Verse two is, okay, you, you drive a few more miles and you pull off on the opposite side of the uh, Appalachian Trail there and, and you look at this other overlook. It's a completely different view, but of the same reality below, right? So a completely different view of the same reality below is the issue of love. And he brings up this issue of loving other people. Again, something that's been brought up now for at least four times uh, in the Gospel of John. Let me read verse two again. This is how we know that we love the children of God, by loving God and carrying out his commands. So what John does is he ties together a concept that it, it's often awkward and difficult for us to tie together And to be honest, we don't often want to tie them together. We have a natural resistance to tying these two concepts together, and we live in a world which will not tolerate us tying them together, okay? So what he says is this, how do we prove, how do we demonstrate that we truly have love for other believers, or maybe to put it a better way, because this is God's eye view, um, from God's perspective, what does love for other people look like? And the answer is that we obey God. Do you see that? Love for others is demonstrated by a love and obedience to God. And this is where it gets real, and this is where it gets difficult, and this is where it gets hard, okay? Particularly as Christians, and this has always been the case, But in Paul's time, they understood it. In our time, we begin to understand it. And almost everything in between was some of this sort of awkward mix of Christianity and culture where you got to pretend that there wasn't a conflict between the two, right? And so this is Christian Europe, right? This is early Americana, uh, founded as a Christian nation, that kind of whole concept. I, I, I love that heritage. I am not knocking that heritage. But what I think what tends to happen with Christian Europe and early Christian America is we get to pretend as if there wasn't a battle between the gospel and culture. And where we're at now is we can no longer pretend that, right? Because the culture is openly hostile to the things of God. It's openly hostile to the Bible, just like it was in Paul's day. So congratulations, we are now getting a taste of what it means to be a first century Christian. And I think probably increasingly so, right? With everything that comes with that. So what John's telling us as believers is from God's perspective, loving others has to involve a love for God. It has to involve a commitment to God. It has to involve even an obedience to God. Uh, it, it's, it's two things are like tandem. They're tied together. Uh, you guys ever uh, hear about those people? And some of you probably did it, which makes no sense. I mean, you parachute out of an airplane. It's a good, perfect airplane, and you jump out of it. I don't know why people do that. And, and, you, and you have a way, one way of doing it that doesn't involve a lot of training is you go, you go tandem, right? You're tethered to somebody who's trained, and his job is to make sure you land. Your job is to probably wet your pants and scream on the way down. So those are the two jobs, right? And so that's what you do, because it's just terrifying. And so you jump out of the plane, and you're tandem together, and you go down, and you're falling, and then supposedly it's fun. So this is sort of the idea. These two, and if, if you break that tether, it's like a bad thing, right? Nothing good's going to happen if that tether gets broken. I mean, the one guy's going to be fine. You're not going to be so great. Uh, and so it's the same idea when we break that tether, between loving others and loving God. When we cease to define the love that we have for others through the love that we have for God, we break something and something's gonna die. Something's gonna get hurt. Something's gonna be destroyed, right? And this is really hard for us because my guess is every single family system here is dealing with an individual or individuals who are difficult to love for whatever reason. They're into a lifestyle which you see as painful and hurtful and sinful and destructive, and yet they seem to enjoy 
and love and revel in the destruction that they're heaping on their own heads. And you try to love and to embrace that individual and they live and we live in a cultural context which says you have to completely agree and accept but yet John's tethered us. He's pulling us back to, yeah, you show love. That's your job as a believer. In fact, you can't get away from it. It's biblically commanded. You bend over backwards. You do everything that you can humanly do. You do it all through the power of the Holy Spirit to demonstrate grace and mercy and gentleness and kindness and compassion to that individual, but you do so tethered to your love for God. Your love for that individual is ultimately proven in the eyes of God as demonstrating a love for the king. And that usually means some difficult conversations have to happen. This is where it gets tough for us because you have some individuals that are like, they're like naturally Bible people, which it sounds like a good thing, but what I mean by that is this. It's like they're unable to not have a Bible confrontative conversation with someone every time they see them, okay? So you have an individual who's living a sinful lifestyle that you love and you care about and they're in your family and like every time they're there, you just, well, the Holy Spirit, I need to be faithful, I need to show love for God and you kind of pull out the Bible and you don't mean to do this but what ends up happening is they just don't want really anything to do with you because it's gonna be Bible lecture every time that they see you and so that's one error that we can commit. The other one is, that we back so far off of biblical obedience and having conversations that can be difficult and awkward and then pulling scripture out, we back so far off from that that it simply never, ever, ever comes up. And we're being kind and we're being gentle and we're being open and we're being embracing but God defines true love for another human being as being a love for him, right? So unless we stay tethered to God and to God's truth and to God's obedience, unless we stay tethered to the reality that he has made us ambassadors, he's made us witnesses, he's made us uh, individuals who give testimony to the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ, unless we stay tethered to that idea, then really we've broken something and it only is going to result in that individual who we are purporting to love, that individual's hurt and demise. There are individuals that I love, that I care for, that I think about daily. There's not a lot of them who fall into this latter category I'm gonna say in a moment, but there are individuals I love and think about and care for daily who if I was walking down the street and they would see me, they would cross the street to avoid contact with me because they're filled with that much hatred and anger and difficulty. Now that category of people is not huge. It's actually very, very small, but it breaks my heart that there's even individuals in that category. And it came about because sometimes, in a few of those cases, I use the Bible as a club. I was trying to be loving, I was trying to be truthful, I was trying to be an agent of change, but in my own foolishness, I just kind of came on strong and hurt and quoted and lectured and pleaded and got in their face. But there are other individuals who are in that category that before the Lord, I believe, I was incredibly patient and very gentle and very soft-spoken and tried to use uh, my contacts to speak truth judiciously and even rarely in occasion. But even having those confrontations or con- conversations ended up breaking apart the relationship and I mourn that but yet that's what it means to show love to people is to stay tethered to our love for God because the consequences of severing that tether are so far worse. I had one very dear friend of mine who in a moment of anger as we were trying to discuss with him Uh, the series of affairs that he was having on his wife who desperately wanted to save the marriage, okay? Pleaded with her husband. I was in the home when he actually stormed out of the house, pleaded with him, fell, collapsed outside on the porch, begging her husband to stay, right? But he, there was this 
woman that he just thought was going to be the answer to all of his emotional woes, right? And remember that conversation outside by his car, pleading with him to stay in the relationship. And he looked at me and said, you're my friend, but one more word about this. I will never speak to you again. Promise me not one more word about this. I can't promise you that. I love you too much to promise you that. And to his word, we've never spoken again. That hurts. That hurts. But I come to verses like 1 John chapter 5, verse 2, that remind me from God's view what true love looks like. Okay? And it's not as he defined it. Our God defines it very differently. And yeah, we can be jerks the way we do that. I know that. I've been that. You probably have too. But we've got to keep these two things tethered together. And then, then he says this. Look at verse 3. This is the love for God, to obey his commands, and his commands are not burdensome. For everyone born of God overcomes the world. This is the victory that has overcome the world, even our faith. And then he brings it back to the belief. So who is it that overcomes the world, right? It's the person who puts their faith and their trust in Jesus Christ. Uh, That's the answer. So he begins with belief. He moves to the issue of what real love looks like. Real love for other people is being tethered to our love for God. And then that immediately moves us into the issue of obedience, right? Because this love for God involves obedience and this victory that we get to overcome the world. And how is that even possible? It's possible because we believed. There's like this, this repetition. He brings it back full circle again to the issue of belief. So now let's look at this scenic overlook of obedience, this overlook of victory, overcoming the world, right? So that, that's what that battle means, or that's what that word means, uh, this, this idea of oh, obedience and overcoming the world. It's this battle against culture, this battle against sin, okay? What it does not mean is, you know what? People have been mean to me my entire life. Uh, and I have pulled myself up by my bootstraps, or I have claimed, I've named and claimed some Bible verses, uh, and, and I have went out and I have achieved victory and success, and I've made something of myself. I've overcome the world. Well, maybe, but you haven't overcome yourself, so you still got a problem, right? And, and so this means something very, very different than that. When it says overcome the world, it's referring to that battle that you're in, that I'm in on a daily basis, and it's reminding us at one point in our life, us being believers, okay? It's reminding us that at one point in our life, we weren't even in the battle. Where we were, we were laying dead on the battlefield, already slain by the enemy. And Jesus came and overcame and breathed life into us and raised us up off of that battlefield and put new life into our lungs and into our bones and put a sword of the spirit in our hand, right? This, the, this armor of God that Ephesians talks about and turned us around to face the enemy, but now with his power and his renewed strength and sent us off into the battlefield as he whispers into our ear, it's gonna be rough, but don't worry, the victory has already been been accomplished, right? Overcome the world refers to the reality that sin, although you struggle with it, no longer defines you and no longer owns you, right? That's not who you are. You will never be that person again. And you can stumble and you can fall and you be, can, can, can sort of become mingled into it, but you'll never be that individual. I was with my, my uh, son one time uh, in Ohio and we rented this house. Uh, it was a, a farmhouse and it was right next to uh, uh, this dairy farm. And uh, they, the owner referred to it as the smell of money. Uh, my view was a little different, but nonetheless, that's, 
how he referred to it as. And so it was kind of a neat thing, you know, and so there was this uh, kind of like paddock, there was this area that the, the cattle would come in uh, before he kind of let them in to be milked, uh, and it was just big and thick and full of mud and other stuff, it was all there. And we had this dog that we had gotten that kept getting loose, and it would never come back, drove us nuts. Uh, and the dog got loose, and it was running out in there, and we cornered it in this big, huge uh, area. And so me and Peter began walking out into this field of muck and mud and manure, and we're sinking down to our knees trying to walk into this thing. So I'm there with my muck boots on, uh, and I, I get about halfway over to try to get to this dog, and one of the boots comes out completely buried in this muck and this manure, and I'm standing there like this, trying not to lose my balance. So Peter, sensing my desperation, and I kind of was barking commands for him to grab the dog, kind of tries to make a leap, but as he does so, he loses his balance and, and is, isn't even able to get his hands in front of him in time and face plants, right? Just, just everywhere. And, and I'm just sitting here like this, and he looks at me like with this look of horror. I mean, it was, it was poop and two eyes. That's really what it was, okay? And he looks at me with this look of horror, and I'm like, I am not helping you at all. I mean, I've got, I've got my own issues that are here. But, you know, there was a time in your life that that is where you were stuck, right? But Jesus has overcome that, brothers and sisters. That's not who you are. And I know that we get trapped in our own perspectives and we get overwhelmed by our difficulties. I'm just asking that you do one thing. This afternoon, would you meditate on these verses? Because these verses are God pulling back the curtain and he's saying, I know what you see. You see struggle and tension and difficulty and betrayal. But now, brothers and sisters, not where I say to you, brothers and sisters, he'll say, now, sons and daughters, let me tell you what I see. I see that your belief in Jesus has saved you. I see that your love for others is tethered to your love for me. And I see that you have already been victorious even though you're in the thick of the battle, you have already overcome the world based on your faith and trust in Jesus. And all he asks now of us as believers is that we're willing to sit and bask in this overlook and see ourselves now as believers through his eyes. Father God, we love you and cherish your name. Be with this people. Be with us, Father, today in a powerful and real way. You have done so much. You have granted a victory through Jesus. The belief and trust that we put in Jesus has achieved the goal that you have set it to achieve. It's made us right with you. It gives us hope for a future, and it gives us strength day by day. It's in his name that I pray, amen.